Okay. So now that we know that all antiderivatives differ by at most a constant, um, it's really pretty straightforward now to talk about finding them. Because once you found one, we can add any number on to find others. So we're looking at some examples now of finding some antiderivatives. Please forgive the children speaking in the background. Um, not much I can do with that. I'm trying to block them out as much as I can. So here's the key idea as we do these problems. Is as you're thinking about these problems, keep in mind this following fact that every function is an antiderivative of its derivative. Right? Because every function would be a function that you would differentiate to get uh, its derivative. Of course, duh. Right? Right? It's the function I differentiated. That's what I did to get the derivative. So of course it would be a function I would differentiate to get f prime. It's an antiderivative. So we look at that 5 there. We look at that 5 there. It's okay. Well, what would it have been so that it, when I differentiate it, it turns into a 5? I said, well, when we differentiate powers, we subtract. So that would have had to have been a 6. Now, we need an x to the 5th as our answer. So we say, okay, that had to be a 6th. But you see, when I differentiate it, I can't have any coefficient left over. So I would also have to multiply by 1 6th. I would also have to multiply by 1 6th, and so 1 antiderivative would be 1 6th x to the 6th. And add any number onto that, plus 3, that's an antiderivative. Plus 8, that's an antiderivative, and so on. What about an antiderivative of sine x? What function would we differentiate to get sine x? Well, we'd have to go back and say, okay, well... Sine comes about from differentiating cosine, but then we'll recall, well, cosine, cosine, when you differentiate, it's negative, but I need a positive sine, so my result must be negative cosine, negative cosine. So move on and consider another example. What about square root of x? Well, since we were differentiating, it was helpful to think of it as a power, it's also going to be the case here. So, square root of x is the same as x to the one-half. And we say, okay, well, what would it have had to have been before? Well, to get to one-half, that means you subtract it one from something to get one-half, means it would have had to have been a three-halves. But then we got to divide by that, because I don't have a coefficient in front of that square root of x. So I'd have to divide by three-halves. But dividing by 3 halves is the same as multiplying by 2 thirds. So we get 2 thirds x to the 3 halves. Okay, well, let's consider another one. Oops. Something messed up there in my replay. And I've uh, gotten the answer before I wanted it. So let's consider 8 over x to the third. Well, I can quickly write that as 8x to the negative third. And again, I say, well, um, to get a negative 3, I would have had to start out with something so that when I subtract it 1, I get a negative 3. So that would have been a negative 2. So I'd have an 8x to the negative second. But then to account for that negative 2 that when it gets multiplied, I have to once again divide by it. So I'd take and multiply by a negative 1 half. Okay, and then cleaning that up. 8 negative 1 half would be negative 4. x is the negative second, but we don't like to leave anything with a negative exponent. So we divide by x squared. And so we get the answer, negative 4 over x squared. So now we're ready to talk about a more general rule. And that's the power rule. So first we're going to review what it is for derivatives. And then as we do it, we're also going to talk about antiderivatives. So this is for f of x equals some function x to the n. So with derivatives, we multiply by the exponent first, and then decrease the exponent by 1. That's the process. In terms of exponents, if my function was x to the n, then derivative would be n x to the n minus 1. This is really important. That this is what trips people up a little bit with antiderivatives. It's imagine now I'd make a trip. So I go over here and I went this way. 
went east so many feet and then decided to go south uh, so many feet. Now if I want to reverse that trip, go exact reverse of what I did, since the last thing I did was go south, the first thing I do has to be to go north, however far. And then once I've done the north, now I can go undo the east part, which would be to go west. So the last thing I did in the power roll for derivatives was decrease the exponent by 1. So the first thing I have to do with an antiderivative is to increase the exponent by 1. And then, then I multiply by the exponent, so now I divide by the exponent in terms of an actual formula. If we had x to the n as our function, we then increase the exponent by 1, which would give me x to the n plus 1. And then finally, divide by that exponent, which is n plus 1. So now that we have a little bit of a feeling for antiderivatives, um, and we realize, of course, that antiderivatives all defer by uh, constants, what we're now ready to talk about is another definition. So, we say let f be an antiderivative of f of x. We define the indefinite integral of f of f. Of f. The indefinite integral is a family of antiderivatives. So rather than giving just one antiderivative, it's given the whole group. Okay. Then we say the integral which is written as kind of a little curved s of f of x dx would be capital F, just any old antiderivative plus a constant. And that's known as the indefinite integral of f. Now in the next video we are going to first look at some properties of indefinite integrals and then we're going to look at how to compute some indefinite integrals. We already have a feeling now for computing some antiderivatives, and we're going to continue with the power rule now in terms of these indefinite integrals. So stay tuned.